This, this fantastic thing of beauty is the AOS 7. It's the seven inch big brother of the AOS 5 and the AOS 3.5 family designed by Chris Rosser. And just like these, it's designed to be a very low resonance frame and it's got some novel design features that I think make it the best seven inch quad around. I'll show you how I built this, the components I selected, some flight footage, and the final setup and tune that I settled on. And I chose INAV 4.0 for this rather than Betaflight. INAV has always been a great fit for seven inch quads and version 4.0 is just fantastic. You get nice smooth acro performance plus the big advantage of position hold and return to home when you wanna fly long range or long duration. It gives you fantastic peace of mind. Now, this build video has inevitably got a bit long, but I tried to cover everything in enough detail to help you build your own. I'll put markers down in the timeline so you can skip around to whatever you're interested in. If you're not building an AOS 7 with iNav, you're probably gonna be bored witless. Hello, and welcome to the Whirly Bloke channel. This is YouTube, you know what to do. Subscribe and hit the bell for more videos like this. My frame has just turned up, as you can see, made in Canada. These are cut by, I believe it's CNC Madness in Canada. They're cut to order for Chris Rosser and the delivery and service to the UK, excellent. I can't fault it. Obviously you've got to wait, but then you know, you're waiting for something that uh, is the latest version of the frame. So let's have a quick look at what we've got much like the AOS 5 and the 3.5, got a top and a bottom plate. And I believe these are, let's have a quick look, two and a half mil. Yeah, two and a half mil carbon, which is good. Uh, we've got some bracing plates for the front and the back. These are the camera plates, which are exactly the same design as the ones on the AOS 5, they slot in here, they give some extra stiffness to the front of the quad, which is quite nice. It's those bracing plate, that's the bottom bracing plate, and you get a whole bunch of hardware, including some extra long bolts for the motors, and that's because these arms are mighty thick, and the bolts that you get with motors as standard, they're just not going to be long enough. These arms, 8mm, yeah, 8mm. Now, there is a very interesting design feature on this. The arms on the AOS 7 follow the same design concept as on the AOS 5 and the AOS 3.5, but they're cleverly broken down. Let's see, it goes around this way, there we go. So. That would be the normal layout for the arm that we've seen before on the AOS 5 and the AOS 3.5. But there is a compromise if you have this sort of truss shape. The reason the arms are can be so thick is because they're thin this way. But the layer of the carbon means that you're always gonna be compromising the strength, both the torsion, the tense, torsions and the compression strength. So basically, if the layup was this way, then you're gonna have a compromise on this because the layup's gonna be going more or less that way. What has happened with this design is that there is this small sort of jigsaw piece here, which means the layup for this arm is that way, and the layup for this arm is that way, so there's no compromises in strength. And you get this little sort of cutout here, which is unbelievably accurate it really is good then the motor sits on one side and then you've got these small plates on the other and that holds everything nice and stiff now as with all frames I recommend that you give these a wash in soapy warm or warm soapy water mainly because you'll just get some sort of carbon dust on the edges there it makes your fingers all dusty I've already washed this one 
And one thing to watch out for when I opened this and was playing with it, although the, I haven't gone for the chamfer frame, I don't really need it, um, and the edges aren't sharp, these bits here are like razors. They're unbelievably sharp. So just keep your fingers clear of those when you're assembling it. Okay, so let's get this all bolted together. Well that bolted together very easily. As you can see we've got the bracing plates on the bottom, front and back, and then this cross brace here. That means you can bottom mount the battery. There's some battery strap slots in here, which is clever. I'll be mounting my battery on the top. And the layout and configuration is like all the other AOS frames. It's this truss arrangement for the arms, which is great. Now I haven't put these bracing plates on the bottom yet. The way that this all stiffens up is those go on the bottom and the motor goes on the top and it'll all pull itself together which is very nice. So I shall be doing that in a minute. And as with my other two AOS frames I've gone for the button head bolt option. You can get these countersunk and that looks great. But as I've said before, I have a little bit of a problem with countersunk holes in top and bottom plates because after a while I've found that the copper, the copper, the carbon can tend to delaminate. Whether it's a problem on here or not, I don't know, but I just don't like countersunk in a carbon sheet. So I've gone for the dome head and I just simply put a battery foam strip on top. It's no problem at all. I don't think there's anything else to say on this. It's just like a bigger version of the AOS 5 and the AOS 3.5. And let me see. So yes, there's a whole bunch of longer bolts here, which means there's plenty to go through there and bolt into your motors. Now I have assembled this using the Nigel damping grease. The bigger the frame, the more important this is because this does make a difference. And you can see it in the black box, the black box logs, if I could say it. Now I've used grease pretty much everywhere between the arms and the bracing plates and between the arms and the bottom plate. And I've also used it as thread lock on all of the bolts. You can use this as thread lock, it's fantastic. You don't have to use grease, but there is a measurable difference. I'm guessing, and I'm pretty sure I couldn't feel it in the sticks, but you can see it in the logs. In terms of components, well, the, let's have a look. Motors, I'm gonna be using these Emacs uh, Eco 2, 2807 1300 kV motors. Now 
The recommended motor for this is the iFlight Zing 2006.5 1300 kV. Now, they're just impossible to get hold of. In fact, getting hold of any 1300 kV motor at the moment is really difficult. Now, when these Eco 2s first came out, I remember seeing these, they were around about $30 which is 25 pounds, which was an expensive motor. These are now in Banggood for around about 13 pounds. And all the reports and all the reviews I've seen of these, these are silky smooth. And they're so cheap now, and they look fantastic. And the construction of these, I really do like. And like I said, getting hold of 1300 kV motors that have the 19 mil mounting points they're just really difficult to get hold of for some reason I assume it's just the global component shortage so I should be using those these have got really nice long motor leads as well and I'm hoping that I can construct this in the same way well, I th think I will be able to do the same way rather um, so that I can bring the motor wires along the arms and then into here and back solder them so there's no wires sticking out through this triangle of doom here I tend to prefer that back soldering approach. It looks neater and you're less likely to get the wires caught on any branches or anything like that. So that's the motors out of the way. I've got four of those. And for the props, probably to start off I'm going to be using these Galprop Cyclones, which I've had a lot of success with on the other seven inch, the Gap RC Crocodile 7 and on my Chandrones um, uh, octocopter. Now, these are quite stiff, and I know people have said eh, they're rubbish, but I bought a whole bunch of these, and I found them to be pretty good. So I'm gonna try these, but I've also got some of the HQ Prop 7x3.5s on order, which are gonna be turning up sometime soon. So don't have to worry about that too much. So those are the props. Flight controller, I'm using this Sussex, success, whatever you call it. This is the DF7 Twin G. This is 50 amps, which is probably a little bit over the top because although this is going to be a big quad with these motors, the current draw isn't huge. So this is probably a little bit over the top. And this is directly DJI compatible. It's got the um, twin gyros on it. I've used these on a couple of builds. I'm very happy with these. I did review this a little while ago, so check that out. Camera, uh, well, I'm going for the Polar Pro, the Polar, sorry, um, Cadex Polar um, camera. Not with the Vista, but I'll be using this full-size air unit. Now, if you saw my other review of this Polar camera, it is fantastic. I was always a fan of the full-size camera. I thought that was the best of the bunch, despite all the other things like the Nebula and so on that are available from Cadex. When I tried this Polar out, I was blown away by how good it was, and it means I can do night flights, and the quality of the image at night is spectacular. So I think that's all components. There will be a GPS module on here, which I'll be using the Matek M9N 5883 GPS and compass module. And there'll be a Vifly Finder 2 um, drone finder in here as well. Well, there we go. Everything's all made up. Now I have put quite a few packs through this. Everything is tuned. I opted for iNav, mainly because iNav and seven inch quads it's a match made in heaven. They really are a perfect combination. I don't know what it is about iNav and 7 inches, but they fly very, very smoothly. Plus, I'm planning on doing some long range with this, and I really want to have the confidence that return to home, position hold, and all that sort of thing is 100%. Now, I've done another little video, which I'll link up here, which shows the setting up of the GPS and the uh, magnetometer. And it's very important to get this mounted up nice and high, which I'll go through in that video. And the return to home on this works perfectly. Failsafe works. I've just turned the transmitter off and it just comes home and lands within about half a meter of where it took off, which is fantastic. 
So the arrangement we've got for flying is we've got two 1250 milliamp hour GMB batteries. These are rated at 130C each and they are simply parallel together with a little adapter that I've made up here. It's running for the HD camera, my Insta360 1R with the one inch mod and the boosted pack on the bottom. This is my favorite camera. It's just so versatile I can do 360. It's got a one inch sensor. Fantastic. What is the all up weight of this? It's not light. I wasn't expecting it to be. Let's have a look here. All up weight is 1.35 kilograms. That's heavier than a Mavic 2. <laughs> but this will do more than a Mavic 2. And in fact, in terms of flying and smoothness and the position holding everything, it's very much like a Mavic 2. Anyway, let's have a quick look here. The Insta360 1R, it really is a fantastic camera. I've got the boosted battery base. These are incredibly difficult to get hold of now. Um, I don't know why they weren't more popular, but it gives you two advantages. One, the battery lasts forever, plus you've got this really neat mount at the bottom. So you can use the original mount, which I quite like. Very nice camera, that. Let's get these batteries off. And there's plenty of options for mounting the batteries. You could mount them end-to-end, side-to-side. You could even mount them underneath if you want, but they fit very nicely on the top here. And as you can see, there is the GPS module on the back. And sneakily, I've also got a LiDAR module, which I'll come on to in a minute. So let's get to the top off this and show you what is underneath. So in here, we have got the Polar Pro camera, which is Starlight, which I've used before and does me, give me some excellent performance at night. I'm planning on doing some night flights with this. We've got a full-size DJI Air unit and the flight controller is all bolted here. This is the iFlight Sus XD F7 Twin G. That's 50 amp ESCs on there. I've mounted the antennas for the DJI unit in the same way that I did for the AOS 5, if I can find it. This works really well. Everything's out of the way. You don't get any of these flapping about all over the place when you're doing your acro. I was able to actually get the wiring, didn't have to back solder, but it's all neatly contained within the frame, mainly because this body is so wide. We don't have to worry about anything breaking or catching in here. We've got our low ESR capacitor and the spike suppressor underneath. Here is the ViFly Finder 2 buzzer. Now, the wiring for the GPS module goes via this GPS mate. Now, I've reviewed this before. This is an excellent little product from ViFly. It basically acts as a pass-through and sort of a drone finder as well. The main thing is it's got its own battery. So when you disconnect the main battery, it keeps power on the GPS module. So this doesn't even have to warm start, it's always on. This battery lasts for half an hour, something like that. And if you disconnect the power, this will actually beep like the Finder 2 but it's not as loud, so I've just put them both in. There's so much room in here. Now, although this is a very heavy quad, you know, it's over a kilogram, it doesn't perform like one. These motors, the um, Emax Eco 2 2807, that's it, 1300 kVs, they have so much torque, and the power delivery is just consistent through the power range. When you're taking off, when you're punching out, when you're cruising, it's very, very predictable. Now, they are rock solid. And I'm going to be upgrading my Chandrones Thick to use some of these, which are on order. By the way, these are very difficult to get hold of now, but I found that if you go direct to Emacs, their delivery and service to the UK is excellent. And their prices are about the same as everybody else, but nobody else has got them. 
anything else to show on here? Well, I think I've covered this pretty well in my other video. And it's the high rise mount for the GPS module. You need to keep this up and out of the way. It's a bit of a compromise because this will introduce some resonances in the yaw and roll. Not so much in pitch because it's very stiff, but this is quite stiff. It's not too bad, but you need to keep the GPS module as far away as you can from these power leads and from the motors just to keep it away from that EM noise. That needs to be, well, it's very sensitive. And if you watch my other video, you'll see that the performance on this is fantastic. And I've covered how to set that up in that same video. And everything is tied down generally with tape because I found this, found this to be the, the best way to do things. The problem I find with using tie wraps on here is it pinches the cable and that's just a point of stress on the cable. And I don't think there's, there's a bit of strain relief here on the battery lead. So I think that's about it, to be honest. Building this is dead simple. There's so much room in here and you've got plenty of room to route your wires nice and neatly. And it's a breeze. So let's have a quick run through how I've got iNav set up. Let's connect to the quad. Calibration. I'm using magnetometer, so the compass has been calibrated outside. Don't try and do that inside. I'm also using the LiDAR and optical flow sensor, which you can see up here, and that's calibrated. I'll be doing a separate video on that and looking at surface mode. Mixer, no real change. I've got Quad X selected, props in, all very standard. Outputs. Now, here's an interesting thing. When I was tuning my Shandrones Thick, because the flight controller didn't fully support eight motors using D-Shot, I had to settle for multi-shot, thinking that was something inferior. But as it turned out, multi-shot is a very smooth protocol. I've tried this on seven inch quads subsequently, and I don't know whether it's seven inch quads, I don't know whether it's iNav, not quite sure, but multi-shot is so smooth, it's ridiculous. It's almost like the D-Shot protocols are too punchy. It's very strange. If anybody knows why, drop me a message in the comments. That would be great. Everything else here on here is fairly normal. I've got the motor idle at 15%. Might be a little bit high, but it stops the yaw twitch when you throttle off. Throbble, I think it's called. Ports. So I am using UART1 for Serial RX, and that's the S-Bus signal on the DJI Air Unit. UART 2 I'm using as the DJI OSD. This is the protocol for that. And iNav 4, I've improved the amount of information that you can display in the OSD from the DJI Air Unit. They've really done a great job on that. UART 4, I'm using for GPS. And UART 5, I've set to MSP because that's where I've got my flow and sonar sensor connected. Onto configuration. The easiest and quickest way to set this up is to set these all to auto and let it auto detect and it does a great job of that. I2C speed I've left at 4 kilohertz. I've changed the mag alignment just because of the way that I've mounted the magnetometer, the Matek module. That's a little bit of a fiddle but it's fairly straightforward to do and I've covered that in that other video. GPS, that's turned on, we're using U-Blocks, and I've set the ground assistance type to European because I'm in the UK. Everything else is completely standard. Failsafe is set to return to home. Okay, let's look at PID tuning. Now the defaults for seven inch on iNav work pretty well. And this is a very low resonance frame, so I was able to push the derivatives on roll and pitch up about five notches on each. Motors run beautifully, they're not making funny noises, and they come back cool, which is fantastic. And also I bumped the P's up a little bit, probably about five points each. Rates, I've left these pretty much as they are, although I have changed the max roll angle and the max pitch angle. Those are things that normally only apply to angle mode, I'm not using those, 
but it does apply to position hold. So I've changed that to 45. I think the default is 30. Filters. Now, the great thing about iNav 4, they've actually removed some of the knobs and switches, which makes life easier, if you ask me. When I looked in the black box logs, the AOS 7 frame is very low resonance. And of course, it's 7 inch, of course, the motors are running a little bit slower. I was able to knock the main gyro filter cutoff frequency down to 95. Everything else is standard. So a quick look at the advanced tuning. The only things I've changed here are the default navigation speed. Normally that's something that applies to waypoint missions, but it is the speed for return to home. And I've bumped that up a little bit. And here's the multi-relative max banking angle that has to match what we had on the pitch tuning page. Hover throttle, the best way to set this is to do a flight with all the batteries that you're gonna use and your camera and just the whole payload, let the quad hover, then look at your black box logs and fathom out what the hover throttle setting is. You can pretty much guess it, but you can measure it properly using the black box logs. I find somewhere between 1200 and 1300 is working for the AOS 7 fully loaded. I've changed the return to home altitude to 30 meters because where I fly, there's lots of tall trees. 30 meters is fine. And one other thing I did on this, which isn't set as normal. I've set nav disarm on landing to on, the default is off. That simply means that when you do a return to home, when it lands, it'll turn the motors off, which makes life much easier. Okay, let's have a quick look at the OSD. Now iNav 4 has made some great improvements in what you can display on the OSD from the air unit in the goggles. It used to be you could just display the cell voltage and the number of satellites, but they've improved on this significantly and that's great. It makes it much more usable. So we can display the altitude up here. And what else have we got? We have got the distance to home, the direction to home, and the ground speed. Those are the only things I need to know. And that's it. And there we go, that's all the setup we needed to change in iNav4. I have to say iNav4 is particularly good. With these dual 1250 milliamp per hour LiPos and an all up weight of 1.3 kilograms, I'm getting six to seven minutes of flight time. And if I junk the 300 grams of the Insta360 1R with the one inch sensor and the boosted battery, I get about another minute if I cruise around very carefully. Now that's not bad, but I'm planning some long range with these dual lithium ion packs I built using Sony VT6 cells. Now I got 35 minutes on my Crocodile 7 with the lower spec version of these that I built last year. So we'll see how that goes. And I want to try some night flights with this. The Cadex Polar Pro is fantastic for night flying, as I found out with my AOS 3.5 build. And this Insta360 1R with the one inch sensor has excellent low light performance. And I want to see how well the LiDAR and optical flow sensors work in iNav, so watch out for that. And as soon as there's anything interesting, I'll post some more content, particularly some long range flight footage. I'll leave links to all the components I used in the description so you can check the latest prices and please leave a comment and let me know how you get on if you decide to build your own. Of all the AOS family, this is my favorite and for good reason. It just flies so well, especially using iNav 4.0. It's a perfect fit. And these Emacs Eco2 2807 1300KV motors are particularly smooth and make the whole flying experience fantastic. And it'd be great if you could subscribe and maybe buy me a coffee to support the channel. As always, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. It's easy breaking down in the bright lights When you've been going around every dark side But something in your eyes tells me you're a wild child Hungry for a good time, honey Lots of pretty lies, drinking up the time now just
dressing up your mind and falling.